right now I, I feel like the entire economic world is like Wiley e. Coyote who's just gone around a bend and he's off the road, he's in midair and he hasn't held up his little umbrella yet and said, yikes. But that's where we are. That's where we are. We are there now. And, you know, there's no physical metal available anywhere, pretty much. It's all gone. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance and Reluctant Preppers. We have a guest who is so heavily requested by our audience, and so many questions have been submitted ahead of this guest that I'm only going to be able to ask a few during this episode. We're talking to Rob Kirby. He's the founder of KirbyAnalytics.com. We're joining with Rob this Thursday, March 26, 2020. Rob, thanks for joining us. My pleasure to be with you again, Dunnigan. A disproportionate amount of the repos... Uh, dating back to before, well before Christmas, a disproportionate amount of the repos were being done in the mortgage-backed securities. And now with the, with the emergence of this virus, the mortgage-backed market has suffered a very, very serious blow. And, and effectively what's happened is the, whole, the entire mortgage-backed security market, in my view, has become junk. And that's really, really lethal. And because the Fed is the only buyer in the world for mortgage-backed securities. You see, if, if, if I'm correct in my assumption, and I believe I am, but I view mortgage-backed securities being no better than double B securities right now. And double B securities should be trading 650 basis points over treasuries. But the Fed's valuing them like their treasuries. When they do the repo operations every day and when they buy mortgage-backed securities, they're paying basically pretty much par with treasuries for something that's really only about a double B in my view. And that becomes very problematic because that what that means is that, like the Fed's the only buyer in town for, for this MBS crap. And uh, Fannie and Freddie can't sell any of their inventory in the real market because if they do, they have to write down their entire inventory and then they're bankrupt. Double-edged sword. So, you, the, 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 you know, and, and you can't have a government guaranteed institution going bankrupt. Okay, so then the issue becomes the Fed has to basically take Fannie and Freddie on their back and the residential real estate mortgage-backed security market's $11 trillion, and the corporate mortgage-backed market is 4 or $5 trillion. Oh, man. And the, and then and when you consider that the Fed's the only buyer for any of this crap, then it becomes a question of well, how big can the Fed expand their balance sheet? They're already at four point six trillion. Unlimited. Well, That's okay. Well, all I'm saying, it's sort of like saying, it's sort of like saying, um, if you're going to pour out five quarts of water. I'm going to take it all in, but I only have a three-quart receptacle to put it in. So somewhere there's going to be a mess. I don't believe the Fed can expand their balance sheet through $10 trillion and have the dollar maintain its form. And I don't believe that the Fed will be able to auction debt if this continues and you know if you if you haven't noticed the amounts the amounts that they're spending imply that the amounts that need to be auctioned and the amounts that are going to need to be monetized over yet 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 still like the numbers are spiraling up like you know 
It used to be, you know, a hundred billion here, a hundred billion there. Pretty soon, you're talking real money. Now, now it's five, two trillion here, four two, trillion there, yeah. six trillion, you know, ten trillion. You know, and next thing you know, old Jed's a millionaire. And Don't you want to run with the big dogs? <laughs> One day, he was shooting at some crude, and up through the ground comes a bubbling virus. I don't know. This doesn't work. And then, you know what's amazing? You know, the only, the only thing I'll say that's amazing, but perhaps not, given given that we know what they do, why the price of gold isn't at eight or $9,000. Yeah. We're getting into the time where I had, a, had this discussion, very spirited discussion with a good friend of mine a little bit earlier. And he, like, he's just blown away. He's a real smart market guy. And uh, just a brilliant, brilliant guy. And uh, you actually might have met him. He was at the, the thing in the summer. Oh, okay. He's the guy, the just retired Air Canada pilot. Okay. Okay. And uh, really brilliant guy. And so he was saying to me tonight, he said, I can't believe these guys are doing what they're doing. I said, well, you know, get used to it because it's going to get crazier before it, before it ever stops. And... I just said, this this is going to end sometime very soon now. And he said, what makes you so sure? I said, because right now I, I feel like the entire economic world is like Wiley e. Coyote, who's just gone around a bend, and he's off the road, he's in midair, and he hasn't held up his little umbrella yet and said, yikes. But that's where we are. That's where we are. We are there now. And, you know, there's no physical metal available anywhere, pretty much. It's all gone. And uh, the mints, a lot of the mints and a lot of the refineries have shut down. Yeah. And I don't think they're even going to be in a rush to open back up. I think every day they wait, uh, the more money they're going to make because they all have inventory. They're all sitting on inventory. You know, like I asked, I asked a good friend of mine who deals a lot with the Royal Canadian Mint. And I, I asked him one day about, this is back about a year and a half ago, because he had, uh, I, I, was, I, was, I was exploring doing a large silver transaction with him to buy Canadian maples. And so, and at the time I had asked him, you know, is X amount of, maples available it was like serious amount and he he went away and he came back he said yeah they're they're you know they could be available but you'd have to probably give them 60 days to make that many i said oh and just for fun i'd like to know how much gold would be available and he said unlimited i said okay well what's unlimited to you <laughs> You know, like some people think, you know, some people think a hundred million is a real lot. And I said, so how much is unlimited? He said, 10 billion. No problem. That amount of product is in the system. Okay. So if that amount of product is in the system, and if by staying closed an extra few days makes the price go up another three or four or five percent that's serious money i'd stay closed longer if i had that kind of inventory in the pipe and it's in the pipe in north america it's in the pipe in asia it's hard to find any they don't have any in the pipe most of the metal that's in asia is coming out of africa eh? big difference most of the metal here in the pipe, it's, you know, it's native. It's from Canada. You know, like we we mine about two. We 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 mine just under what you guys mine, but the distribution in in the U.S. Uh, goes through many many different outlets. In Canada, most of the inventory goes through two places only, and the bulk of it goes to the Royal Canadian Mint. So it's either Johnson & Matthey in Canada, it's either J&M or it's the Royal Canadian Mint. And the Royal Canadian Mint probably gets the lion's share of it. 
in America, you've got many competing forces. You've got the you got the U.S. Mint. You've got you know got the bullion banks that are big, 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 and and there are in, many independent refineries. So metal isn't as concentrated in as few refining hands. Uh, here as it is, I mean, I mean, it's more concentrated in fewer hands here than it is in, in your country. And that's just an, an anecdotal sort of quip. But anyway, I would be sitting on inventory, and I'd be in no rush to reopen because you know, watching watching your inventory appreciate as you uh, remain closed ain't, ain't such a bad deal. In Canada, are the mints uh, constitutionally bound to operate if they can at all? Is, is there any, are they just operate as, as businesses, or are they are they a branch of the government? Are they required to by law to run? Royal Canadian the Royal Canadian Mint is a crown corporation in Canada, a, a for profit crown corporation. So it's owned it's owned by the Canadian taxpayers. Um, you know they're not. I mean, you see. We're operating in unprecedented times. You know, there's never before been a pandemic where, you know, people have been ordered to shutter businesses. And that's where we're at today. And I mean, the Royal Canadian Mint, for all intent and purposes, is not viewed as a, an essential service. Probably less of an, uh, an essential service as the U.S. Mint, because the U.S. Mint is mandated to basically produces many silver maples and gold maples, or sorry, eagles. Hey, watch it. Yeah, yeah there, here you go. You're going to get the beavers after me. Maybe a maple tree will fall on my house. <laughs> but, the, but, but the U.S. Mint is mandated to produce as many eagles as, you know, the public wants to consume. And that that may or may not be somewhat of an anachronism mm -hmm. uh, as as an actual hard and fast law, even though I believe it is an old law it that is. they have to produce as much as there is demand for. Uh, but but I mean in in Canada, I mean you know I mean a crown corporation, you know I, we're not making them for the queen, even though her her bust is uh, emblazoned on one side of them. Um, but I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's more of a tradition probably than anything else that the Royal Canadian Mint has always provided, uh, maples, uh, I mean, because they operate the, the Royal Canadian Mint's operated on a for-profit basis. So anyway, that's the way it works, but we're in crazy times and who, who would have ever figured six months ago I mean, other than the CDC, who were hiring quarantine specialists back last November, so obviously they knew something was up, uh, but they didn't want to share it with us back in November because they were they were hiring quarantine managers for Washington, for Texas, and I believe for New York uh, back in November. So, uh, you know, how they got the tip off uh, that. You know, this thing was coming down the pipe. You know, it, it almost thinks they might have had a hand in it. But, hey, who am I? I'm just a guy in Canada trying to connect dots. And the picture I see when I connect dots a certain way is a picture I'm not really fond of. Let's put it that way. And we're seeing a lot of conflicting narratives and we're seeing numbers coming out of some countries that don't really resound or, or let's just say they don't square with the narrative. Um, you know, how a country, how a country like Italy can be losing as many people as they're losing, uh, and have the case count that they've had, uh, and I, I forget how many how many deaths it is in Italy, but I believe it's well through a thousand. And I mean, Italy is a population of around 80 million, and um, China has a population of 1.4 billion, and yet Italy's lost more people, I believe, than China, and that number doesn't really square very well. 
Uh, Iran is a country of roughly 80 million, and I think they've lost more people to death over this virus than China. That number doesn't really square with the Chinese numbers. Then there's the small matter of there being roughly 21 million mobile cell phone accounts that have been lost in the uh, uproar in the last three months in China. And uh, so there's 21 million people three months ago that had cell phone accounts that don't have them today. And you got to ask yourself, where did 21 million, did 21 million people all cancel their phones at the same time? Um, that number doesn't square well with the official number out of China that roughly 2,000 people have died. Because as far as I know, dead people don't pay their cell phone bills at the end of the month. Last time I checked, at least that's the way it works in Canada. When you die, you stop paying your mortgages. Oh, yeah, and also, when uh, speaking about mortgages, uh, the reason why I truly believe that the entire mortgage-backed security market is, is no better than a double B credit at this time is the fact that when people don't have income, they generally don't make mortgage payments. Yeah, you, for, you foresee and, a big bunch of uh, yeah. Defaults, so, yeah. and when people die, they don't they don't make mortgage payments. And if you're holding, if you're holding, if you're unfortunate enough to be holding mortgage-backed securities, and you know that the pools of payers are going to be critically impaired from making good on their obligations, um, the, the value of those mortgage pools get, get dramatically written down. Sure. And that, that sets off a chain reaction in that if, if mortgage-backed securities are typically no better than, in my view, probably a, maybe a double B uh, at best right now, um, that means they should, in the real world, be trading 650 basis points over treasuries. And that means nobody in their right mind would be paying the prices that the Federal Reserve is paying, uh, either through the repo market or in outright purchases, to own mortgage-backed security debt. Well, and how about the uh, the exchange stabilization fund and what prices they should be paying to buy the Dow uh, at this point, given that all these companies are operating in a world that is shut down for a quarter? Yeah. Interesting you should bring up the exchange stabilization fund because our buddy, uh, the economic advisor to, to President Trump, Larry Kudlow, he, he brought up the exchange stabilization fund, I believe it was uh, maybe yesterday around noon, I think he did a press, press conference where he said it might be time for us to find a function. I, I, I'm giving you the gist of what, what he reportedly said because I didn't listen directly to, the, to this press conference myself, but I, but I had somebody phone me and, and fill me in, and, and we had a long discussion about this. And he said, what do you make of Lawrence Kudlow talking about the exchange stabilization fund in a press conference publicly? I said, well, he's the first person from the White House or from Wall Street or connected to officialdom that I have heard mention the exchange stabilization fund probably in the last 25 or 30 years because nobody dares speak of it. And when he did bring up the exchange stabilization fund, he spoke in terms of maybe we should um, uh, refund or inject some money into the ESF and do so in a very transparent basis and uh, have the Exchange Stabilization Fund do some work in terms of the uh, correcting, helping, assisting in the economic malaise that we have. But the fact, the fact that Lawrence Kudlow brought up the Exchange Stabilization Fund to me is a tell. And the tell is something like this. The Exchange Stabilization Fund, their fingerprints, in my view, have been all over 
the interventions that we've been seeing in all of our capital markets for a very long time. And my guess now is that the interventions are becoming so big, so rampant, that they have that they have to acknowledge that the, the ESF is actually there, alive, and doing stuff. And what they want to do is, I think, acknowledge that the ESF exists and maybe try to assign it some function so that when it's like when the, when the billows of smoke become so intense, so thick, they can say, oh, yeah, well, that's the Exchange Stabilization Fund that we told you about, that we were going to, you know, that we were going to engage in a certain certain way. Um, I mean, the notion that he's say, saying we should refinance the Exchange Stabilization Fund, I don't think the ESF really needs a refinancing because I believe that's where the missing $21 trillion that Catherine Fitz and Dr. Mark Skidmore speak of and have documented I believe that's where that money is held. But more, more than anything, I, I, I believe that Kudlow's acknowledgement that the ESF is there and uh, could be utilized to perform a function is basically a deflection of what the ESF you know, has been doing on an ongoing basis for a very long time anyway. So the stagecraft on the part of uh, Larry Kudlow, I believe. Um, you know, and then, you know, just looping back to this mortgage-backed security issue, if these mortgage-backed securities are only worth uh, or should only be rated at maybe a double B, uh, which means they should be trading at 650 back of treasuries, which would mean that if Fannie and Freddie were to try and sell any of that debt. Uh, they would have to mark their inventory if, like, if they like, if they sold mortgage-backed securities that the Fed is currently valuing at par with Treasuries. <laughs> and then we find out that in the real market they're only worth uh, a fraction of what the Fed's paying for them. Not only would it create a problem for the Fed, but it would also mean that if Fannie and Freddie sold them in the real market, the free market, reflective of a double B. Uh, they'd have to mark their entire inventory down dramatically, and they would be technically bankrupt and insolvent. And the U.S. Treasury and the federal government is not about to uh, bring upon that sort of a scenario for Fannie and Freddie, because the the impairment the impairment to their portfolios would be dramatic. Um, but in in basically in backstopping the mortgage backed securities market, which the residential side is eleven trillion roughly, corporate side four to five trillion, and the Fed's the only buyer for any of that in town. And then you have to start asking yourself questions about the size of the Fed's balance sheet, currently around $4.6 trillion. And if they happen to be the only buyer in town for an additional $16 trillion worth of mortgage-backed debt, uh, the numbers just start to become – It's. I mean, it's one thing you see, Dunnigan, when, when, you, when you're juggling ping-pong balls and you graduate up to juggling tennis balls – and then maybe you say, heck, I'm going to juggle now tennis rackets. But when you try juggling Volkswagens, you know, there's a little weight problem. Um, it's a little bit tougher to juggle Volkswagens or Volvos than it is to juggle tennis balls. Um, because the weight of, of a Volvo would crush most people. Um, maybe not you. Because because you are prepared, so and lucky you that you you've been prepared all along, and you know people, isn't it amazing the 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 wise words of Mr. Kaiser for how many years now done again uh, about six, being prepared? Six years. Yeah, and, uh, six and finally, 
finally the day when you know those 25 year uh, food food rations are uh, are a welcome sight and and, uh, and and a very happy thing to have stowed in the pantry. Um, but anyway, uh, here we are. Unprecedented times in financial land. Um, the, the precious metals have been held in check and been brutally, brutally beaten with a stick still, uh, if not every day, every other day. Um, you know, anything that represents alternative, uh, a viable or a possible alternative to the dollar as a store of uh, uh, purchasing power has been brutally held in check and or punished, whether it's whether it's they've been the precious metals, which should be at quantums higher levels than they currently are in 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 the wake of the dramatic monetary debasement we've witnessed in recent weeks uh the cryptocurrencies have have also been had taken big haircuts uh in recent weeks um but i mean i only view that from the standpoint that the powers that be in the financial world have been very, very well aware of the monetary debasement that was due to come. And they, they wanted to make sure that when the inevitable launch in the prices of alternatives happens, uh, they wanted it to be from a lower base. But mark, you know, mark my words, the price of precious metal is going up. The price of cryptocurrencies in nominal terms are going up um, because they have to and they will. And there will be nothing that can keep them down. And for people who think that they've bought into a flight quality trade or that U.S. government debt represents quality or value, Let's see what kind of value U.S. government debt is really when we add another eight or ten trillion to the pile that's currently held by the Federal Reserve, because that's also where we're going. And the 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 saying "inflate or die" is a statement that truly, truly applies to. Uh, to the Federal Reserve and the U.S. Treasury right now. And if they don't inflate, they do die. And if they do inflate, they destroy the dollar. And it doesn't really matter. I mean, if you butter both sides of a slice of bread and you throw it in the air, it's going to land butter side down. And right now, what's going on in our financial universe, both sides are buttered. And one, and, and it's gonna, it's gonna land butter side down. And that's a guarantee. That's, that is not, and that's not emotion. Uh, you know, the, the destruction of the dollar is well underway. And, and the destruction of the US dollar as the world's reserve currency is now in an advanced stage. And, uh, I don't know, questions, questions from you. Yeah. Well, uh, you mentioned, about precious metals and this disparity between the constrained supply, physical supply versus the uh, the downbeaten price. Uh, can you talk to us about how long you think that that mechanism is? Are we at the verge of the mechanism breaking? I think it's broken now, Doug. Um, I mean, there 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 is no metal to be had. Um, the what people are paying in the real world to get to obtain physical metal uh, versus the spot price, uh, it's, it's, it's just two, two separate things. I mean, we have a, we have a spot price today in, in silver or yesterday, um, which is roughly, what was it, $13? Well, up to 14 and, and three quarters. Yeah, go ahead. Are we at 14 and three quarters now? So, okay, so 14 and three quarters – um, I'm, uh, U.S. dollars, and let's just say that the Canadian dollar currently is probably trading around 1.45. Let's let's be conservative. Let's say that the Canadian dollar is at 1.5. So at an exchange rate of 1.5, uh, 
um, uh, I mean, 1.5 times 14.75 would be 70 some odd, seven uh, dollars and change. Uh, so if we if we said that if we said that uh, a Canadian uh, an ounce of silver is probably at on the spot market is probably worth around at the very most twenty two dollars just using the exchange of the Canadian dollar um, on top, you know, the exchange rate uh, on, on the silver price of 14 and change. So uh, an ounce of silver and spot in Canadian dollars should be around $22. And, you know, uh, one outlet that I follow on a quite regular basis is the availability of physical metal, for instance, at Sprott, uh, Sprott Money, uh, Eric Sprott's company that sells physical metal. And they had one offering of silver only in the last number of days. And, and I looked at it yesterday, and the only physical item of silver they had for sale, everything else was sold out, by the way. They had no 100-ounce bars. They had no coins. They had, they had one offering, and it was a 10-ounce Sprott uh, Hallmarked silver bar, 10 ounces. And they were selling that for 375 Canadian dollars for a 10 ounce bar. So, you know, we just went through the math that, a, that an ounce of silver should be around $22 Canadian at spot. And Sprott's got one offer of physical silver in their entire inventory, and that's a 10 ounce bar at 375 Canadian dollars. So that's Fifteen one five dollars over spot. Um, if if you were looking ever looking for evidence that the that the uh, price discovery mechanism is fraudulent or broken, you need look no further than that. Because I'm and I'd be quite certain that Sprott is probably selling silver bars at that price because they're one of the few places that actually has product that they can ship. And uh, when, when you have a spot price of $22, and, uh, but physical transactions are occurring $15, $15 higher, um, your, your spot price is, you know, is, is no more meaningful or no, no more relevant in the real world than, than the latest uh, comic strip of Dilbert at the back of the newspaper. So the, 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 COMEX, the COMEX price discovery mechanism is a com comic strip. Might, we might as well call it the COMEX strip because, <laughs> because it really is a comedy and a play on words because it has, it has as much to do in the real world. And, you know, and, and this, this, is, this is the manifestation and the outcome of many, many years of regulators looking the other way hmm. while precious metals prices have been manipulated and manhandled and suppressed to the point where the derivatives markets can't even get their act together anymore, uh, Dunnigan, because we have a disparity, uh, I believe it was yesterday or the day before, the disparity between London, there you go. let's just call it London yeah. local spot, and the futures price got as wide as a hundred dollars. Yeah. So you know when when two criminals can't decide how to shear a sheep, it's 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 indicative that you know the the, the you know the, the the lunatics are in charge of the asylum. Well, yeah, right. I I got to jump in with two things. One is for people who still want to obtain uh, physical gold and silver. I'm now a licensed uh, dealer's rep for Miles Franklin. You can email me at libertyandfinance at protonmail.com. There'll be a comment underneath this video to help you do that. But the other yep. thing is, uh, what you were talking about there is, can you talk about this new announcement? I think it also came out yesterday or early this morning about the COMEX, or I guess we'll call it the COMICS, um, uh, saying that they're going to be shipping, uh, they're going to try to change their rules so that they can satisfy uh, demand for physical with London bars and instead of because they can't they can't uh, do it with Comex bars is, is the Comex yeah. on the verge of sure. of failing yeah. to deliver yeah done again I'd like to address that where I come from that's called default okay it's called default it's it's called when you when you when you've lied and cheated 
and stolen people's money and you can't make good on your contractual uh, obligations, you change the rules. You see? But you see, COMEX really has never been anything more than a private club. And, you know, private clubs uh, have the ability to make their own rules. What, 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 what is shameful and very sad, very saddening is that uh, US, the U.S. government has sanctioned or, or basically given, uh, given people the false impression that there was regulation over these entities. Uh, the Commodities Futures Trading Commission should all be fired. Every, everybody who has anything to do with that organization should be fired. They're derelicts in, in performing their duties. You know, they're supposed to act as as arbiters and uh, and the ombudsman supposedly to look after the little guy to make sure that the big guys don't screw the little guys. Well, the, the reality is these regulators are derelict in their duties. They, they, they have shilled and lied and, and misdirected and obfuscated for the people who are the power brokers. And they've done so at the peril of people who felt that they were getting real exposure to real metal, which we now know they don't have, because as we just went through the exercise, you know, the, the COMEX is supposed to be about price discovery and finding a fair and marketable and equitable price for precious metals. But that's not what they do at all. I mean, that's being done in coin shops around America whose shelves are bare. And, you know, there should be very little difference between the COMEX price and the price of, you know, other, other than the cost to refine and a reasonable markup, there should be very little difference in, in the price between what COMEX reflects and what's available in the coin shop. But the reality is our regulators have failed us. Government has failed us so terribly that these two things have utterly uh, divorced themselves from each other. And, and the fraud, the fraudulent price discovery mechanism, which is overseen by the likes of the Commodities Futures Trading Commission and the, and the criminals at the London Bullion Market Association, um, you know, they, they, they've just been shown for what they are, deceitful criminals. You just got me thinking because back in my growing up years, there was just – Absolutely, everybody talked about the um, slimy experience that you'd go through going to try to purchase a car. You go in to deal with a, a used car salesman, or heaven forbid, even a new car salesman. And then in the in the remember in the eighties, there was this big thing about uh, they're going to publish the the manufacturer suggested re resale price, put it right on the on the window sticker of the car. You could get the book, uh, and it would have all the values in there. And dealers were saying, yeah, we'll sell it to you for $300 over over invoice, or we'll sell it to you $99 over invoice. And, and then it became known that that number was an artificial number because the dealers were getting these volume incentive kickbacks behind the scenes and all these other dealer incentives and that sort of thing so that people started to realize wait 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 that that's just a that's just a fictitious number that that, that to mislead and misguide the customer so now you can actually go on and and people report what they actually paid for cars what cars actually sold for you yeah. look that up I mean, in, the, in the era of the internet we should have all these coin shops just reporting the transactions anonymously as far as what the actual selling well, price is and forget the other price. Let's just put it this way, Dunnigan. Uh, the, the, the folks who are entrusted to run the COMEX exchange and the regulators at the CFTC have made every greaseball used car salesman on the planet look like honest Abe in comparison to this deceitful, disgusting job they've done and and the and the misplaced trust and uh, uh, you know uh, ability to lead and to and to uh, be arbiters uh, what what a, what a what a travesty of justice and what a travesty of, of call of duty on the part of these people to make to make them like a, to make the worst used car salesman look like look like an ace and that's what they've done and uh you know we haven't seen the end of this yet because you know 
this this is the kind of thing done again that unfortunately leads to social like breakdown in the social fabric and, and that's where this is probably likely headed because you know as as much as these people have been exposed for for the fraudulent activity they've been engaged in they still seem to be pedaled to the metal and hell-bent on continuing this fraud because they really don't seem to want to back away from it so it's anyway, I, I don't I don't see there being, you know, I've written many, many times and have said this story won't end well. There is no happy ending to the story, unfortunately. And it's going to get uglier before it gets better. And uh, all I can say is people who do have or are able to get hold of physical precious metal, uh, which can still be done even at this late hour. I think people will be well served if, if they're able to, you know, procure and get some physical precious metal uh, to add to their, you know, to their to their asset mix. So that's where we're at and that's where we're headed, at least in my opinion. Several of our uh, viewers' questions are so many on the same theme. I can't name all the names of them, but guys, please know that I, I'm combining several of your questions. Are concerned about the potential for government confiscation of privately held precious metals and whether there's a way of reducing that risk by keeping them, you know, in your own possession versus in in uh, in segregated accounts or that sort of thing. Do you see a safer uh, place or way or strategy to to reduce the risk of potential confiscation? Or do you think that's just not realistic in the first place? Well, if they, it, 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 frankly, it, I look at it this way. If governments at this point, given that we know the complicity and how criminal the price suppression has been uh, and how fraudulent the price discovery mechanism has been, they've already stolen from us, done again. They've already they've already lied to us and they've already stolen from us. So if if they think they're going to actually confiscate now the the physical, my attitude is somewhat of let them try, because you know I mean if anyone asks, just for the record, I don't have any metal. Okay, so they can come in and look, and but they won't find any, and. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you don't have any either, because wh why would anyone want to hold that? So, and I mean, gold and, gold and silver, gold and silver lives just as well at the bottom of a hole as it does in a vault or in a safe. And if the powers that be wish to start digging holes and making pockmarks, over vast acreage to find minuscule amounts of metal, all the power to them. What do you see? You've talked to us in the past about like uh, oil dynamics uh, between countries and so on. There's a question on other commodities than metals. Two questions here. Abby McDonald. Yeah, let's talk about oil. Oil is yeah. a great thing. Pablo Pina asks, what's going on in the oil market and are these low oil prices here to stay? Well, for, 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 the, for the sake of everybody who lives and works in Alberta, Canada, I sure hope, like, whether, whether all listeners know, Canadian oil sells at a big discount to West Texas Intermediate. And we have a grade of oil in Canada called Western Canadian Select. And that's the benchmark oil price in Canada. And Western Canadian Select oil closed today uh, at six dollars and fifty cents a barrel, and it costs about forty-one dollars to produce it. So, you know, you've heard the saying, you know, we didn't, we're not getting quite the price we want, but we'll make it up on volume. Um, there's no way to make that up on volume, and frankly, frankly, if we had leadership in this country, okay. If we had leadership in Canada, I mean, I would have ordered I would have ordered the entire output of Western Canada's oil patch. I would have ordered it shut. And understand when you have a president in your country who says that America is self-sufficient in oil, we ship you over four million barrels a day. Okay, and you know, I know oil consumption is down 
due to people not working sure. and due to the economic malaise we find ourselves in as the result of the virus. But over 4 million barrels a day is a pretty big hole to fill or to patch. And frankly, my, in my view anyway, this should be cut off. The tap should be turned off and it should remain shut. It's cheaper for the oil workers in Canada to stay home than it is to pump oil right now. And the fact that they're still pumping any is a travesty and another failure of leadership. And, you know, this is another story that won't end well because there's no happy ending to this story. But this, this is what happens when you have uh, markets where, where prices are not truly uh, uh, set in uh, by, by free market conditions. Like there, there's manipulation that occurs in the oil market, like there's manipulation that occurs in the, in the precious metals market. And, I mean, for any, for any, for any trolling clown who thinks, well, Kirby's long oil, no, I'm not long oil. I'm a Canadian, and I'm concerned about what's going on in my country. Our country, my country is being raped. My country is being raped right now, and I don't like it, okay? And I wish we had leadership that would at least say they don't like it when it's occurring. So but we don't have that in this country, um, which, is, which is a shame. And, you know, we continue to pump oil or produce oil uh, when we're losing, I don't know, $35, maybe $36 a barrel so that we can ship oil to America at $6.50 a barrel. Go figure. It's interesting because we, you know, you talked about uh, this, the artificial suppression of gold and silver prices and now the uh, economic upside downness of, of another commodity of oil. Uh, we have a question from Abby McDonald who says, will commodities be like gold when the food supply thins out? Um, let's put it this way, in, in, at least in my view, with the amount of money that's being created out of thin air, we are coming to a point where Despite despite the depression that we've seen uh, lately in uh, in well in precious metals in cryptocurrencies in crude oil, um, uh, there will come a point where we will hyperinflate because the doll. I mean the, the 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 commodity or the thing in the world that's being created at an infinite pace is U.S. dollars and U.S. debt. And that debt, that debt ultimately is going to be worthless because it's never going to be repaid. Because America does not have the capability of repaying its current debt other, other than to repay it in, in future dollars that will be worth dramatically less. And, and baked into that cake is a guarantee of hyperinflation. And what that means is the dollar unit will ultimately achieve its true intrinsic value, which is zero. And, you know, I, and I've said this many, many times in many, many interviews. There will come a time when you cannot purchase an ounce of gold or silver with paper money or with digital dollars or however you want to express what a dollar is or was. We will come to a day where you will not be able to purchase precious metal with money as we've known money and you will not be able to purchase oil or gas, a tank full of gas with money as we've known it. And I mean, we basically are staring down the barrel of, of, of a Zimbabwe type style gun. And that's what's in our future and the current and the current efforts by the Monetary authorities has virtually guaranteed that this will be the case. And something else I want to throw on the pile is that back in the fall, back in the fall and in recent interviews, I have said and stated many times that the amount of money 
that needs to be created on a go forward basis. We, we have, we have, uh, on, on, on the life cycle curve of growth of fiat money, we transited to a vertical growth curve a number of months ago. Back in the fall, we were clearly on a vertical trajectory of money growth. And isn't it interesting how back in the fall, the Fed could not have said we have to create trillions of new dollars because there was no stomach for it publicly. But whether, whether people believe it or like it or not, because money grows with compound interest, uh, and, and if, you, if you're familiar with Chris Martinson's work and talk, I mean, he uses the compound, the compounding growth to show how the explosion of virus cases mushrooms up. Our money growth works on the same principle. The amount of money in creation has to grow vertically and geometrically, not just vertically, geometrically up. And lo and behold, you know, money could not have been expanded geometrically six months ago without people uh, getting into uh, a serious state of concern and upset and revolution. But here we are today, I mean, we have a virus, and now geometric money growth is okay. It's Not only just okay, fun. but welcome so, to, oh, you're, you're helping us out. Yeah. Exactly. But it's acceptable now right. to, to the right. masses. And the interesting thing, whether you want to believe it or not, the conditions that were in place last fall said that the money was going to come whether or not we had a virus. Right. If you can accept and believe that, if you can wrap your head around that, and if you can't wrap your head around that yet, you don't understand what uh, uh, compound. You don't understand the true nature of compounding and how it leads to exponential growth. Because we are in, on a part of the growth curve where money has to grow exponentially, and now it is. And we've got a virus to blame for it. And if we didn't have a virus to blame for it, we would have had to invent another excuse to do the same thing. Whether you believe that or not is up to you. You're um, known for your metaphors. I would have thought a good metaphor here might be that a crime scene being being uh, covered with a with an arson. I mean, it's like we ha we had to get rid of this crime scene, and now they're actually welcoming us. Let's, let's burn this building down because it's got some germs in there. Yeah. Essentially. Well, it's yeah, but that's, that's, I mean, that's what we're experiencing. Like I say, and a lot of people have trouble with the concept. A lot of people think that, you know, uh, most people are conditioned to think linear and linear growth. People can understand linear growth very readily, but when you talk about exponential growth or factorial growth, right. it doesn't compute with most people. Until you look at the way the viruses spread, when you have an R naught that's you know up around three or four, uh, because you've got this compounding effect where where the numbers don't grow by a hundred constant every day, they grow geometrically. You know, a hundred becomes two hundred becomes four hundred becomes you know, or it, or it gets squared, and then it's like you know you get mushrooming growth. Well, money with compound interest works the same way. And the amount of money that's required to service debt, it grows in that fashion. So just, just as the, the virus count grows geometrically, the amount of money that needs to be put into existence, it also grows geometrically until it basically collapses of its own weight. And, I mean, ultimately, the virus will burn itself out. How many people die between now and then is, a, you know, it's open for conjecture. And I'm not going to conjecture on it. I mean, I don't believe the numbers that have come out of China at all. 
The fact that there are 21 million fewer cell phone accounts in China today than there were three months ago tells me probably a lot more than 2,000 people died. Does that mean 21 million people died? I wouldn't say that. But would I be shocked if I found out that 6 million people died in China? Not for a heartbeat. So I, I can't really answer. I mean, I don't know. Uh, but I find it very odd and peculiar that there's 21 million fewer cell phone accounts today in China than there was three months ago. And not supportive of 2,000 people dying. Right. Before we wrap, I want to ask you this question from Ronald Huber. Do you still believe that negative interest rates in the U.S. will blow up the derivative market? Well, isn't it interesting that as the Fed has cut rates to almost zero, we have seen three-month LIBOR come down to single digits, and in recent days, it, there's this silly thing going on where, where three-month LIBOR is actually backed up in, in spite of record uh, Fed purchases of treasuries and bills and anything with, a, with an interest rate attached to it, three-month LIBOR has actually backed up, and it's up over 1%, and, and, it's, and it's backed up, I think they said, the last 10 days in a row. And they say that's completely and utterly counterintuitive. And my, 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 my view on all this is that if three month, you see, if three month LIBOR gets to less than 25 basis points, um, and, I, and I'm going to actually rejig my, my whole stance on that, uh, because I, I, I actually question the, uh, uh, I, I question ISDA, the Investment Dealers, uh, Investment Swap Dealers Association, how they would deal with negative rates in an in a interest rate swap on the floating rate side, and they told me that if, if rates go negative, they use absolutes. So, which means that a floating rate payer would pay, if, if, if three month LIBOR was to go to one eighth of one eighth of one point, so 12 and a half basis points, um, the three month floating rate payer would pay one eighth of a basis point, whether it was negative an eighth or positive an eighth. So if three month LIBOR gets to 12 and a half basis points, the floating rate payer pays 12 and a half basis points on, on quarterly resets. If it goes to negative one eighth, the floating rate payer would still pay 12 and a half basis points on their floating rate resets. Um, because they, if it goes negative, they use absolute. So it doesn't matter whether it's a plus or a negative sign. But the real issue is when it gets close to zero, because if you've got someone paying a fixed rate, which is positive, fixed rates remain positive, uh, because you're never going to get a five-year or a 10-year fixed rate negative, okay, uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in the corporate world. It doesn't happen. So, but if, if, you, get, if you get floating rates at zero, uh, that's extremely toxic. Because if you've got somebody paying, like on a notional amount, which is the way these derivatives work in swaps. So if you've got someone paying 1% on 100 million a year, you know, 1% of 100 million is a million. So if I'm paying out a million and in return I'm getting nothing, like I'm getting screwed. Like I'm just losing money. There's, 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 there's no compensation. Nothing. I mean, I, 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 I would, if I'm, if I'm receiving fixed, uh, sorry, if I'm receiving floating, someone's paying me a floating rate, I would rather the rate be negative a quarter than zero. Because I'd rather get paid 25 points than zero. The real problem is at zero. The real problem is right, is clustered around zero. Zero is painful. And I think you'll see that if rates do go negative, okay, I didn't realize they adopted this in 2016. They, 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 and I was unaware of it. But So they adopted this thing where if, if, 
you know, if floating rates go negative, you use the absolute. And so, so in, in that, you know, you, you won't see rates at zero. If they're going to go negative, they're going to quickly go, they're going to quickly go left of negative because the floating rate side has to get paid something because on the fixed rate, you're paying. If you're paying, you need something back and, and, and it's got to be greater than nothing. <laughs> like if you're getting nothing back, if you're getting zero, you're screwed. So if they go negative, they'll quickly go, I believe, hard left, but zero hurts and zero is toxic, which is why we saw three month LIBOR, I think recently bounce off minuscule to nothing rates because the system is built to not want that because zero, zero is, zero is more toxic. Believe it or not, for a floating rate receiver, zero is more toxic than minus 25. I, I said that was the last question, but I did want to get this one in from Texas Kerr Dog, who says, Mr. Kirby, how will life change for a household that only holds debt and paper assets versus a household that owns precious metals and no debt? Well, it's, you know, how, how, how is life going to be for somebody who has a fridge full of food and somebody who's living under a bridge and has no food? If you have physical precious metal, ultimately you will have the ability to provide something. And if you have your net worth tied up in, in, in debt instruments, uh, you, you, you own, I mean, it, now it depends. If you have 30 day government paper, you'll get repaid in 30 days, probably, most likely, you will get repaid. But if your if your sustenance or if your net worth is tied up in ten year paper that's supposed to yield something, uh, the odds of you getting ever getting repaid diminish the longer the term of the holding is. So, uh, like at some point, at some point, uh, debt paper is the worst asset on the planet to own. The worst, okay? Because a lot, because it's not going to be repaid. For every dollar the U.S. government borrows today, uh, the odds of them repaying you or making you whole on your investment diminish with each passing day. Because the, the amount, the amount of debt that currently is outstanding, uh, it's too big for the U.S. government to repay good value. So you're, you will be repaid less if you're repaid anything. I mean, if, if you give me $100 million today and, and in five years, if I give you two bags of confetti um, and say that we're square, um, you're not going to be a winner. And I, but I might be completely legal in doing that, being the person who borrowed the money, if I'm the government. But that's where people are headed if they hold the bulk of their um, uh, assets in debt yielding instruments. So, and that's that's the way that one will work out. Unfortunately, that it will work out that way. We've been speaking with Rob Kirby, the founder of KirbyAnalytics.com. Rob, if people want to follow your work, what will they find there? Uh, you can find me at kirbyanalytics.com and please support. All help is uh, greatly appreciated and uh, because without you guys, we're not here. Well, Rob, just thank you. Our viewers always request you to come back. They're, they always flood me with more questions than I can possibly ask you. We had probably about 30 pages of questions. I haven't been able to scratch the surface. But just thank you for joining us here on Liberty and Finance and Reluctant Preppers. Been my pleasure, Dunningham. If you've decided that now is the right time for you to protect your family's financial future by acquiring physical precious metals, gold and silver, I'm delighted to let you know that I have now become a licensed dealer's representative for Miles Franklin, one of the oldest and most trusted names in bullion dealerships. And we can provide you with physical delivery to your personal possession or to professional vault storage or precious metals IRAs. Just email me at 
Liberty and Finance at protonmail.com and please include your name and phone number in your email to Liberty and Finance at protonmail.com. We'll get right back with you and find out how to best meet your needs so that you can either begin or increase your acquisition of physical precious metals now and protect your family's future starting today.